do, Dan? Where are you? <laughs> All right, Genesis chapters 1 and 2. This will be today, so open up there. Um, as we started last week with Psalm 84, last week was kind of our primer, or prequel to our Christmas series. Uh, but this year we're going to be uh, considering the presence of God. The presence of God. And this is the presence of God. What we're going to be doing these next four weeks is from creation to Messiah. So uh, it's not creation to new creation. That's for this coming weekend. So quick shameless plug. Story of God this weekend. Again, uh, if you want to come out for that. This is only creation to Messiah. Okay. Now, I want to say this. Um, we all know the significance of people's presence in our lives. Right? Anybody? Why? Because when it's not there... We feel the loss of it, don't we? And, and just think practically if you got to travel for the weekend and you're away from your spouse or something like that, right? You don't get your good morning kiss. You don't get to sleep in the same bed. You miss the presence, right? I haven't experienced this yet, but think about your kids leaving the house. There's some in here that have experienced this. Go off to college or other things, right? They leave the house and you what? Miss their presence. Uh, think of, what else do I have here as an example? Uh, moving. Think of moving. Anybody ever moved away before from a place you loved and you were settled into for a while, right? Uh, we've done that too. Uh, move away from friends, from family, from church family. You leave and you miss their presence, right? You miss them. And worse yet, we all know this when you lose a loved one, right? You miss their presence. And again, you, you, we don't just miss, oh man, I, I really miss what they used to do for me. They used to rub my feet or something like that, right? Uh, and people are like, yeah, no, I, I welcome any foot massage. Uh, or what they did around the house or what they did for the family or something like that. You don't just miss what they did, you miss them. You miss the person, right? Whether we realize it or not, we, we certainly take it for granted on a daily basis. We cherish people's presence in our lives. And we don't often think about what it's like to not have their presence in our life, right? And the Bible tells us a story of how we were always made to live in the presence of God. Human beings were created to live in God's presence. And again, as we're going to see today, this is not just some sort of indirect thing, like, ah, oh, you're, you're in the room, but I'm not really paying attention to you kind of thing. It's not some impersonal thing, but it's in presence, in relationship. Because the claim of the Bible is this, that we were made for God. Here, hold on, let's see if this will work. Let's see. All right, strike one is about to come, and guys, you're going to have to click it. Go ahead, click it. There we go. The claim of the Bible is this. We were made by God and for God. And this is the main theme I want us to see today. We were made by God and for God. We were made for relationship with this God. Right, we were made to live in his presence. And as the past week, if you were here for the story form night, we said with no shame or fear of rejection. We were always meant to be there in his presence. But we know as the story goes on, and I don't want to get into the falling weeks, but things get messed up. right? And so to clarify our lens of what this is supposed to look like, let's start at the beginning. Start at the beginning where the one true God created all things and he relates to his creation in the way that he always originally intended to. Right? So often when we look back or look at life, we look through it, at it through the lens of fallenness, through rebellion, through sin. But let's start at the beginning before that came into place and see how things were. So we're going to be picking through chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis. I know that those are long. We're not reading the whole thing. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to give a brief word on this book. Um, in these chapters of Scripture, uh, we are told the story of creation. And I just want to pause and say, that's amazing, right? That is absolutely amazing. You, uh, there are so many people who wonder about this question. Right? Why are we here? Who made me? Did an alien civilization come plant us and we've involved or something like that? Right? Were we Sasquatch offspring or something? Uh, there's people wondering about this question, why are we here? And what am I supposed to do? And the Bible claims to have the answer. Like, that's amazing. That's actually incredible. But with that, I want to say this is not written to satisfy our 21st century curiosity about the details on how God created the world. 
Unfortunately, if you've been in the church long enough, you've probably experienced this. Uh, Genesis is typically taught uh, or discussed around debate or controversy. Anybody? Oh, wow. Okay, only one. That's great. So just me then. Uh, But it tends to be looked at through the lens of this. Um, You know, how can I figure out what my mind wonders about and the deep questions I have, right? Rather than viewing it the way God intended us to read it. So here's some of the questions we ask. Were the days literal 24-hour days, or were they big periods of time? One of my college buddies, I don't know why he got so hung up on this question. Were the first humans really tall, or were they really short? I don't know. Does anybody have a guess? I don't know. They were short. Okay, so Mike, you're just a weird offspring of something. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, Dan, too. All right, the rest of us are pretty normal, but apparently you're not. Uh, did God create the world with age, right? Or was it like a new shiny car that would eventually get wear and tear, right? Was Ken Ham really there at the beginning? These are some of the questions that we ask. What about the dinosaurs, right? And on and on we could go. And and I want to say, those conversations are tempting, right? And, And they're fascinating, but none of them are the point whatsoever in this text. John Steck rightly says this about the Genesis account, if you can see it up there. This is what he says. He says, Moses' intent, which most people think Moses wrote this, Moses' intent was to proclaim knowledge of the true God as he manifested himself in his creative works. That's one. Two, to proclaim a right understanding of humankind. Three, to uh, the world. I'll just say that. The world. And four, in history that knowledge of the true God entails, and this last one's really important, and to proclaim the truth concerning these matters in the face of false religious notions dominant throughout the world of his day. So I want you to think of when this is being written. This is being written at a time where society is very polytheistic. There's many gods, and we just got to satisfy them because they're all mad at us or something like that. Right? So he's writing this in the face of polytheism, uh, and he's saying, no, there's one true God, and he made all things by the power of his word. Right? Um, he's writing this at a time where people worship the sun and the moon, and you notice in the Genesis account, he doesn't actually say sun and moon. Right? He just says the light in the day and the light in the night. I'm botching the words now. But he won't even call it sun and moon because people worship those things. So he is writing this in the face of false religious notions to show what was true about why we're here, who created us, and all these things. So these chapters are not for us um, to gush over the details. And I know that we have some people who love Ken Ham in here and all those things. And again, that's cool. That has its time and place. Um, But they're not the main point. And in my opinion, my humble opinion that often is wrong, um, to make those things the primary matters of this account is to make the text about ourselves. You ever hear uh, the phrase, it's man-centric? Right? That is to view the scriptures in a very man-centric way. How can this satisfy my curiosity instead of viewing it uh, through the main character that we see in chapter 1, verse 1? In the beginning, who? God. And so I guess my plea, I know anytime someone teaches in Genesis, it's like, oh, okay, here we go, um, is that we would maybe shelf those things for a moment and, and not view this from a man-centric way but a God-centric way. And so let's not get hung up on the science debates and details and instead just get lost in the story of how awesome this God is, how he created this world, how he's created us, and how he's ordered everything to work. It's an amazing story that we're being called into. So with open Bibles, we're going to start in Genesis 1, and we're going to start with verses 1 through 5. I don't have it on the screen, so if you have your Bibles, you can open there. Genesis 1, 1 through 5, and three things we're going to look at today is um, God, the world he has created, and humanity. God, the world he's created, and humanity, and how does it all work together, and how is God present, and what is this all about, okay? Genesis 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. 
God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. So, right at the beginning of this book, it's um, not, hey, this is how we were made. Let me tell you right here. No, right at the beginning, we are transported back to the origin of everything. Right? To the mysterious personal source of all that is the eternal uncreated God. This story is about him. And the author tells us that this uncreated God created the heavens and the earth, he says. And, and this is meant to say um, everything that we see down here, right? And everything we see up there and even beyond the things that we can't see. But then the author says this, but the earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep waters. So this is meant to tell us something, and it means that this, this place is inhabitable. It's not a place to live in. It's not a place for humanity to live in. And it's supposed to convey this idea of being unordered and chaotic. But, not a trick question, who was present? God. God. It says the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And what's he there for? He's ready to bring order. He's ready to bring beauty and flourishing to this place that he has created. In verse 3, we see God merely speaks a word of command to bring light into the darkness. And God saw that the light was good. He calls the light day and the darkness he calls night. And Genesis 1 just continues this, this theme, the theme that we see, that God speaks and all of creation comes into being. If you want to follow along, I'm going to just kind of do a, a scatter shot here. Uh, day 2, God speaks into existence the sea and the sky. Day 3, he speaks into existence a fertile earth. So this is like plants with seeds and uh, fruit trees and vegetation. Day four, he speaks into existence the sun, moon, and stars, although the author does not call it the sun and moon. And then day five and six, we have all these regions, and then day five and six, God begins to fill these regions with living creatures. He fills the waters with the fish, he fills the heavens with birds, and he fills the land with living creatures, each according to their kind. And God looks at all that he has made, and it is good. And then on day seven, and I know I skipped the humans, so hold on. Day seven, God rests from all of his creative works. So what have we learned about God and what have we learned about the world from Genesis chapter one? First, God, that this God is the creator of all things. It's like, yeah, duh, I know that. But I also want you to see this. He is the provider of order in this world. He's the provider of order, meaning he ordained how it all is supposed to work together. So number one, God, go ahead, guys, go back one, okay, God is the creator king. God is the creator king. So God didn't just create this and say, okay, everything's done, good luck, hope you guys can figure it out, there's a lot of potential in creation, right? No, he's not just creator. This God is also ruler of all his creation. He is king. Um, Von Rad says this about the Genesis account. He says, The idea of creation by the word expresses the knowledge that the whole world belongs to God. Because God caused the creation to come into existence by his word, He establishes himself as the king over all of creation. So this is the kingdom in which God rules and reigns, right? It's right here in front of us. This is God's world, right? The the old hymn, this is my father's world, right? All of creation is God's kingdom. It's where he rules and reigns. That's important to see. And yet, since the fall of man that we're going to see next week, how it separated us from the presence of God, people refuse to acknowledge God as the one who created who ordered and who rules over the world. Now, I want to say that's not just for today. I know people think, oh, things are worse than now more than ever. I don't, I don't think that's true, honestly. I think it's always been bad since the fall of man. Um, but he rules and has ordered and created all of it, and we refuse to acknowledge him as such, don't we? As humans, um, this is an authority over our lives that we simply don't want. Now, I would say maybe now more than ever, people hate authority, right, in, in terms of speaking out against it and everything, which is rightfully so in some cases. But no one wants to think that they're under authority. Right? No one wants to be under anyone or anything. 
Why? Because we want to be the ones calling the shots, right? And we want to lay the groundwork of this is how it should be and this is how it shouldn't be, right? And we see this in the world all the time, that God has ordered things a certain way, a natural way, in a good and right way, and we reject it, right? We flip it upside its head because we reject it. But in the ancient Near East, when this was written, um, people knew all about this reality of authority. The rulers of their day had an authority that was nearly um, absolute, you could say. Uh, we even see in some cases, think of the pharaoh in Egypt, right, that the, the nations would start worshiping their king, right, bowing down. And we see in Daniel that the people started praying to the king, hence why Daniel got thrown in the lion's den, right? This is the authority and the power that monarchs had. And because of this, even the lightest word of a mortal king was to be understood as, yeah, that's a command. I heard him say it, and we have to do it. But I want you to see the contrast. Our immortal king speaks, and by his divine command, all of creation springs into being, exactly as he has commanded uh, it to do so. That's why at the end of each day, God says it is all good. And why is it good? This has been a common theme. It's good because he's good. So second, what about our world? God is the creator thing. And our world, from here, Genesis 1, it's all good. It is all good. And it is a place where God is present. Or he's ruling over it. He's ruling in it. And he is satisfied. This is a good place. This is what the Bible refers to as shalom. Everything is right. Everything as it should be. This is pure harmony and peace in all of God's creation. This is good. So what about the humans? Flip over to Genesis 1, verses 26 through 28. 1, verses 26 to 28. This is the portion that we read. We're not going to read the whole thing, but 26 to 28. Then God said this, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Let's see if my joker's in here. No, I don't think she is. This past Wednesday, uh, we did our story form uh, night, and I had the opportunity to work with the teens. Now, this is a sheer joy for me. If you know me, I love working in kids' ministry and teen ministry, and I don't get to do it often. So I had the opportunity to do it, jumped at it, loved it. Um, and once we got through our creation narrative, um, we had some discussion time. And I asked something along the lines of this. Why do you think God made the humans? Why do you think God made the humans? You want to know what one smart Alex said to me? Well, I'm going to tell you anyway. So, um, They said this, because he was lonely. <laughs> because he was lonely. Now, um, this person was joking, right? I, I hope, at least. Uh, they were joking, but it launched into great conversation around this idea that God, of course, wasn't lonely, Right? He is our eternal God, one God existing in three persons. So he's never been lonely. He knows what it's like to live in relationship because he is eternally satisfied within his triune self. And this is why we are two relational beings, by the way, which is why if we don't have relationships, we suffer because we were made in the image of our God who is relational. So God wasn't lonely, but what we did talk about was this. That God didn't need relationship with us, right? Because, oh, I'm just so lonely. I need somebody in my life. Right? He didn't need relationship. But he wanted relationship. Right? He didn't need it, but he wanted it. He wanted something in all of his creation that could relate to him in a unique and intimate way and that would represent who he was in all the rest of creation. And that's what we see with verses 26 through 28. Verse 26, it says that, that humans were made in the image of God, which means that above all the rest of God's creation, we as human beings, no matter how old you are or young, no matter the color of your skin or gender, we resemble him and reflect him the most above all the rest of God's creation. 
And this is why we fight for life, right? For the unborn, for racial re reconciliation, all these things, because every one of us, believers and unbelievers, uniquely image our God. Because we were created to be like Him. And we have a life that is within us that is sacred and is not to be taken lightly. Right? We have thoughts, or right? I hope we have thoughts. We have emotions, even though some of us don't know how to access them. Right? We have emotions. We have the ability to love people. We have the ability to receive love from people. We are his image or his reflection, if you want to say that, in all of creation. And we relate to him like nothing else does. Verse 26b, we also see this. That we were created to have dominion over all the rest of God's creation. So, second part of this, we were made in the image of God to relate and to rule, right? We, as human beings, were created to be God's tangible rule on earth, right? And then he goes over and he gives the list, rule over the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, the live sick on the land. And we even see in Genesis 2 that the animals come to Adam, and what does he do? He names them, right? He's, he's exercising his dominion and his God-given rule that he is sharing with Adam and Eve, Verse 28, God then blesses them and he gives them a commission to be fruitful and multiply. Why? So that humans could expand God's rule more and more as image bearers span across the world. So this God that we see in the Bible, this is important. Remember, writing this in the face of false religious notions, this God in the Bible that we see is a God of sharing. Right? He doesn't have all this power and authority and keep it to himself like an insecure guy who doesn't want to lose it right? He shares it with his created beings. We were created by God to be his managers or stewards of all creation. And so that's Genesis 1 in a nutshell. If we were to summarize all that, God, world, humanity, God is the creator king, the world is good, God is present and satisfied in it, and humanity is created by him that we could relate to him uniquely and rule over his good creation. Now, chapter 2, and Steve has taken a class on this recently. You could tell why they're so different. Uh, but chapter 2, we see a microscope get put on the creation of the humans and how they end up in the garden. So we're just going to read a small portion of it. Genesis 2, look at verses 15 to 17. Genesis 2, uh, 15 to 17. says this, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then we see in the next section that God says, You know what? It's not good that man should be alone. I'm going to make him a helper suitable for him. And he makes Eden out of Adam's rib. So Adam is now in the garden at this point. He's in Eden. God has placed him there. Now, how many of you guys have a garden at home? Anybody? I love living in a rural area. Almost everyone raised their hands for things like this. If I need an illustration that I know is not going to bomb, just go farming, and I know it's there. Um, and I think sometimes I have a tiny garden, so I, I, my picture of this is very skewed because I don't view it that way. But I think sometimes we, 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 it's tempting to think of this as like a household garden that Adam and Eve are in. But if you look at verses 10 through 14, this is more like a major national park that they're in. Uh, one uh, commentator said they're the first conservation officers. Where's Lisa? Should you help me with this? Um, and we see in verses 10 through 14 that four major rivers flow through this place. It also says in the middle of the garden was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there they are in this beautiful, amazing, life-giving uh, place called the Garden of Eden. And they are satisfied. They are enjoying life. And I also want to point out this, the garden was also the special place where God would come dwell with the humans. Turn over to chapter 3 for a moment. I know I'm doing a bit of an overview here, but look at chapter 3, and we're not going to unpack this now, but verse 8. This is skipping ahead to after they ate the fruit. Verse 8, chapter 3, verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God, pay attention to the wording, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the what? The garden, in the cool of the day. Now pay attention to the language here. And the man and his wife hid themselves from what? The presence of the Lord God 
among the trees of the garden. So, getting back to our theme from this Christmas series, what did Adam and Eve hide themselves from? The presence of God. Now, we're not going to unpack all that today. That's for next week. But what we see is that Adam and Eve, these first humans, were accustomed to the presence of God coming and dwelling with them in Eden. This was a place where both God and man dwelt together. It even says that they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, meaning like kind of a breezy, maybe the sun is going down kind of thing. So in some way, shape, or form, God was in the garden with them, and he was present. He was there, and this was not a surprise to them, right? Now, people debate what this looked like. Is this the pre-incarnate Christ coming uh, because God is spirit? I don't know what, how I'm supposed to look at this. Is this just like the, the, the breath of God blowing through there, and the trees are rustling, and they heard that? But it's, right? We don't exactly know how uh, this played out, but what we do know, the main point of this, is that God was there. He was present with this people. He made it to be this way, and they were not surprised by it. This was normal for them. So, this brings us back to this. The earliest account of human life shows us this, that we were made by God and for God. As his unique image bears, we were always meant to be in his presence, and as John Piper would say, enjoying him forever. But as we'll see next week, sin has separated us from his good presence right sin has separated us from him but as christians and this is the reason that we have hope this is the reason we have hope we believe that this creator god and say all right scrap it i'm done starting over right we believe he's in the business of fixing that which we have broken so that he can again dwell with his people amen amen God's not scrapping it. He's in the business of fixing it. He's reconciling it back to himself. But here's what I think that we do with this. And I think this is an unrealized misconception we have of what this uh, looks like. And I only say this because this is important with Christmas coming up. Um, We look at it this way. Um, We messed everything up, right? So God is up there, and we're down here. And I know I've been taught that up there equals good, but down here equals bad. But one day he's going to take us from this bad place down here and he's going to take us up with him to the good place forever in his presence, right? But that idea, although that's true in terms of if I died right now, I'm going up to be with God. Amen and amen. I I look forward to that day. But that idea doesn't actually get the whole point across of what the Bible is teaching. Because the Bible does not teach a story about escapism from this bad place to go up to a better place. But is actually about this good God coming into the bad place to reclaim what is rightfully his in the first place. Right? This is why we celebrate Christmas. The first advent of the Son, Jesus Christ, which is the kingdom of heaven, has come here. Heaven has come towards us. Jesus left the glory of heaven. He lost status and power and a throne to come save God's fallen world. We were made by God and for God, and Jesus is our only way back to God. And that's what we celebrate as we take communion today, right? That though he was rich, this verse been hitting me, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor. That through his poverty we might become rich. So as we prepare for the celebration of Emmanuel, which means that God has come to dwell with us, right? We remember that Jesus came on a mission. As we see these banners, you might not see them, they're on the side. But it says, from the cradle to the cross. From the cradle to the cross, Jesus didn't come to model a good life for us. He did do that, right? He showed us how to live as humans and how to obey the Father and walk by the Spirit. But he didn't just come to model a good life for us. He came to reconcile all things both in heaven and things on earth by making peace through his shed blood on the cross. That by his sacrifice, we would be set free to live this life with God who made us for himself. So I'm going to have Janelle come up. And and if you haven't grabbed your communion cups, now would probably be a good time to go back and get it. 